2017 to 2019 was an extraordinary time in Northeast Asian nuclear diplomacy. We went from nuclear tests and mutual threats of war to an unprecedented flurry of leaders' summits and even the potential for a formal peace agreement to finally end the Korean War. What made this period so extraordinary was not just these incredible events, but also what the achievements and ultimately the failures of this moment represent in the longer arc of Korean Peninsula nuclear diplomacy since the late 1980s. So with everything we've now learned in Pol 2 CPA about the North Korean state and its vulnerabilities and its foreign policy, we're now in a strong position to understand why Korean Peninsula nuclear diplomacy has been so fruitless over a long period of time and why North Korea's denuclearization as a diplomatic endgame is likely to be a dead end moving forward. In this video, I'm going to look at four significant periods across this long arc of nuclear diplomacy in Korea. We'll look at the first nuclear crisis in 1994, then the second nuclear crisis in the six party talks of the early 2000s. We'll then move on to the 2017 nuclear crisis and the season of summits that followed in the two years after that. I'll finish up by thinking about where to now for Korean Peninsula nuclear diplomacy. We've discussed previously the nuclear fuel cycle in North Korea and the capacity that this provides for the North Koreans to develop a fully indigenous nuclear weapons program. The North built its first nuclear reactor in the 1960s, but this was a small research reactor that was powered by highly enriched uranium, which was provided by the Soviet Union up until 1991. So I've got to stress here, this reactor was used for things like medical isotope production and other very small time research projects. So this was not a reactor that was capable of being a proliferation hazard. It wasn't until 1985 that a five megawatt reactor was built at the Yongbyon nuclear facility, and that came online in 1995. So this was capable of producing plutonium that could be used in nuclear weapons. Facilities for uranium enrichment, for fuel fabrication, and for reprocessing were also built at Yongbyon at this time. Now, this is where the first Korean nuclear crisis kicks off. So after the Yongbyon site is opened and the reactor goes critical for the first time in 1985. North Korea has also joined the International Atomic Energy Agency. And as part of being a member of the IAEA, that requires regular reporting on the fissile material that goes in and out of nuclear reactor burn. So this is intended to prevent the risk of any fissile material being diverted for nuclear weapons proliferation in countries that aren't nuclear weapon states. So fast forward to May 1992, North Korea submits its first report to the International Atomic Energy Agency documenting this stuff. The IAEA raised concerns at this time that the North Korean report contradicted the IAEA's own analysis and suggested that North Korea was keeping undeclared plutonium in violation of the treaty. The following year, March through June 1993, North Korea starts blocking International Atomic Energy Agency inspectors from accessing the nuclear waste storage sites at Yongbyon. So those inspectors, that's how they confirm what nuclear countries report in terms of their fissile material stockpiles. So if those inspectors aren't there and North Korea prevents them from being at Yongbyon, that's a signal that something's wrong, that something's dodgy about their reporting. And so after North Korea announces that the inspectors are no longer welcome, they also announce that they're going to withdraw from the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. However, before this withdrawal takes effect, North Korea suspends that decision. They don't end up withdrawing at this time. But nonetheless, that's a significant move. It's a significant signal to the international community. And in response to that, the UN Security Council passes Resolution 825, which is the basis, you see this referred to in the preamble of all subsequent UN Security Council sanctions resolutions against North Korea. 
This is one of the founding documents of that UN Security Council response to North Korea's nuclearization. So this was the most dangerous conflict flashpoint since the Korean War. At this time, the US was considering options for airstrikes on North Korea. President Clinton ultimately concluded that the risks were too high. Although publicly, he keeps the threat of military action on the table. So they've got to maintain the military option as a, at least a rhetorical threat in order to have leverage. But on the ground in Seoul, residents began air raid and evacuation drills in expectation of a conflict. So this was a really tense time on the ground, particularly in South Korea. It was in this environment of heightened tension that former US President Jimmy Carter flew to Pyongyang in October 1994 in a position as a special US ambassador at large to negotiate a deal with Kim Il-sung to try and de-escalate the situation. So through Carter's intervention, the International Atomic Energy Agency and North Korea reached an initial agreement which involved limited inspections in return for the United States calling off nearby military exercises. Now those US ROK military exercises, they're a big deal because they're a simulation of a war game scenario with North Korea. So all of these military capabilities are massed near the North Korean border. And in the context of a crisis scenario like 1994, all that has to happen is the order for an attack to come and you've got a, an invasion of North Korea. So the North Koreans have to take those, they have to mobilize against these annual war games that the US and ROK conducts. So it was really critical to the de-escalation of the crisis in 1994 that these military exercises were called off and that forces were moved back from the DMZ. So after that happened, Jimmy Carter's mission eventually led to the signing of what's called the agreed framework between North Korea and the United States. So here's the details. For its part, North Korea pledged to freeze and eventually dismantle its nu nuclear reactors. So it stops reactor burn and that halts the production of plutonium through reactor burn. The US, South Korea and Japan promised to establish a joint consortium, so something called the Korean Energy Development Organization, or KEDO, to build two new light water nuclear reactors, which were proliferation resistant and they were intended to provide for North Korea's energy needs. And the US also promised shipments of, shipments of oil aid to North Korea. So remember 1994, the arduous March famine is kicking off and the energy shock is in full swing. So these oil aid shipments were sorely needed by the North Koreans. The agreed framework though never really got off the ground. Neither party ended up delivering on their promises and this illustrated the serious trust deficit on both sides. Now for its part, many policymakers in the United States thought that North Korea was about to collapse. And with that in mind, they thought there was no point giving them anything substantive. Also, the Clinton administration had just lost control of Congress in the midterm elections. So this meant that the agreed framework was never ratified. You had the anti-engagement Republicans in control of the Congress who flat out refused to ratify the agreement. And also mid to late 1990s, you've got the Clinton impeachment drama going on. So that weakens Clinton, Bill Clinton's internal political leverage. So the US doesn't follow through on its obligations under the agreed framework. If we look at Keto and the light water reactor project, well, that was never completed and it was eventually abandoned in 2012. The satellite photo you see here, this is the actual Keto construction site at Shinpo in North Korea. You can see a, a few buildings, but no nuclear reactors. I think there's, as far as they got with the reactor was, was pouring a couple of concrete slabs. But what about the North Koreans? Well, as, as we know, the North Koreans have always distrusted paper security promises. They are also well aware of the fickle nature of American politics, and they could see that the agreed framework wasn't going to be ratified in the US Congress. So they continued developing a highly enriched uranium program in secret. So this program was first discovered in 1998 by the CIA. 
And then the DPRK officially disclosed this program itself in 2002. So this secret North Korean highly enriched uranium program would end up being the trigger for the second Korean nuclear crisis. In 2002, the Bush administration revealed that CIA intelligence from back in 1998, that North Korea had a secret highly enriched, enriched uranium program, which it had been operating in secret in violation of the agreed framework. So in response, North Korea subsequently expelled all IAEA inspectors again from its Yongbyon nuclear site and had this to say in an official statement. So, quote, the IAEA still remains a servant and a spokesman for the US, and the NPT is being used as a tool for implementing the US hostile policy towards the DPRK, aimed to disarm it and destroy its system by force, unquote. In January 2003, North Korea officially withdrew from the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, finally following through on that threat from a decade earlier. And the North Koreans also reactivated the 5 megawatt nuclear reactor at Yongbyon, ending the nuclear freeze and restarting the production of more plutonium for nuclear weapons. Looking for a circuit breaker, the US government agreed to negotiations that involved all six regional states of Northeast Asia, with talks to be hosted by China. So this was the birth of the six-party talks. Now, in moving towards the six-party talks, the Bush administration hoped that the collective pressure of regional states pushing for denuclearization together would compel North Korea to accept denuclearization creating greater leverage than the US could attempt in pressuring North Korea on its own. The US position, which was articulated at this time and has been US-North Korea policy ever since, was called CVID. So that's an acronym for Complete, Verifiable, Irreversible Denuclearization. The six-party talks itself went through five rounds of negotiations between 2003 and 2009. And through those five rounds, it produced three nuclear freeze agreements, all of which collapsed. So let's look at the first of these nuclear freeze agreements. In February 2005, the six-party talks reached this first agreement on nuclear freeze. So North Korea tentatively agreed to give up its entire nuclear program, including nuclear weapons. Now, it's not clear that they actually had any at this time, but this is what they agreed to. And in exchange, the United States, China, Japan, Russia and South Korea, so the other five parties of the six party talks, promised to provide energy assistance to North Korea, as well as to promote economic cooperation. However, the agreement collapsed after North Korea's June 2006 ballistic missile test and its October 2006 nuclear weapons test. Well, what's interesting about this particular agreement, the framework for cooperation that you see on the slide here, this was the framework for this agreement and it became the basis for all subsequent activity in the six party talks. So it's based on themed working groups, and it was based on progressing through phased incremental steps. And importantly, it also remained the basis for cooperation in the US and DPRK summits of 2018 and 2019 as well, until President Trump went for the all or nothing deal at the Hanoi summit in 2019. Following North Korea's first nuclear test, the six parties agreed on a joint statement the following year in September 2007. North Korea, for its part, agreed to begin disabling its nuclear weapons facilities at Yongbyon in exchange for an aid package worth 400 million US dollars. The photo here depicts these negotiations at the Guomao China World Hotel in Beijing, which when each round was held in this location. Unfortunately, though, North Korea missed the deadline to fully disable its weapons facilities by the end of 2007, and this deal, sealed in the joint statement, subsequently collapsed. 
In 2008, another deal for a nuclear freeze was negotiated through the six-party talks. And as a gesture of good faith, North Korea destroyed an obsolete water cooling tower at the Yongbyon nuclear site, which is what you see here. This is the actual detonation. This photo was released by North Korean media. In exchange, the US removed North Korea from the US list of state sponsors of terrorism. So this made it easier for foreign companies to do business in North Korea, because any states that are on that particular list, that comes with the imposition of a very severe set of restrictions and sanctions around uh, the ability of US entities to do business in those countries. However, talks broke down over North Korea's refusal to allow IAEA inspectors unfettered access to the suspected nuclear sites. So there's always this question about allowing international inspectors in to actually verify what North Korea is promising. The following year, North Korea conducted its second nuclear test. So this terminated the 2000 and 2008 nuclear freeze agreement, and it ultimately killed off the six party talks for good. For the remainder of the Obama presidency, North Korea was not really a priority for the United States. During that time, Kim Jong-il had also come to power in 2011, following the death of his father, Kim Jong-il. But it wasn't until 2016 that North Korea intensified its nuclear testing. And this also coincided with the beginning of Donald Trump's presidency in the United States. In 2017, for example, North Korea conducted 16 separate missile tests along with its fifth and sixth nuclear tests. Kim Jong-un also had his brother, Kim Jong-nam, assassinated in a chemical weapon attack at the Kuala Lumpur International Airport in Malaysia. It had become clear by that time that North Korea had completed its nuclear development phase and had now become a fully-fledged nuclear weapon state with a robust ballistic missile capability and deployable nuclear weapons, albeit they were the very small arsenal of those weapons. The pace of North Korea's nuclear end run caught the international community off guard. It was generally thought that it would take North Korea much longer to develop its nuclear weapons capability. US denuclearization policy was premised on full North Korean nuclearization being a risk off into the future somewhere, but all of a sudden that risk had arrived. So this unexpected development was quite alarming for the US foreign policy establishment, and it was also the first really big foreign policy test for Donald Trump as American president. Trump responded to North Korea's nuclear posturing and its typically bombastic announcements to the world with a series of provocative tweets of his own. And it was indeed unprecedented for a national leader to conduct diplomacy through Twitter and essentially sidelining his foreign policy establishment and really unnecessarily inflaming an already tense situation. So we'd never seen anything remotely like this before from a leader of the United States. President Trump threatened to unleash fire and fury and to totally destroy North Korea, in the process suggesting the, pos the possibility of a US preemptive attack on North Korea. Trump insulted Kim Jong-un as the rocket man, as a madman and short and fat. Now there was great irony in an American president giving Korean Central News Agency a run for its money in the hyperbole stakes. But more seriously and more tangibly, Trump also announced the redeployment of the USS Carl Vinson aircraft carrier group, which you can see pictured here. So he announced that they'd be redeployed to waters off the Korean peninsula and also announced an increased military troop presence in South Korea. There was some controversy over the USS Carl Vinson announcement because ship tracking data showed that the carrier group continued steaming towards the Middle East for some time after Trump's announcement. But nonetheless, the announcement itself raised the temperature of the 2017 crisis and the drumbeats of war in Korea were the loudest that they'd been since 1994. And this wasn't just an exchange of rhetoric. 
Leaders and diplomats across the region really did believe that war was a real possibility at this time. It was a pure accident of exquisite timing that the Winter Olympics were held in South Korea in February 2018, and this ended up providing the circuit breaker to this crisis. The Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang brought some time for feverish back-channel diplomacy between the assembled leaders at the Games. The diplomatic MVP of the Games was probably Kim Yo-jong, so this is Kim Jong-un's younger sister. Now, in attending the event, she became the first member of the ruling Kim family to set foot in the South since the end of the Korean War. And while she was there, Kim Yo-jong personally delivered an invitation to South Korean President Moon Jae-in to attend an inter-Korean summit in Pyongyang. You can see Kim Yo-jong pictured here on the top right, sitting next to US President, uh, sorry, US Vice President Mike Pence. And despite the incredible lack of warmth between the two in this photo, the Olympics provided a space for high-level dialogue for the the um, assembled officials to negotiate a pathway out of the crisis. Also, the powerful symbol of, symbolism of the Olympics took some of the heat out of the crisis. So, for example, at the opening ceremony, the South Korean and North Korean athletes marched into the stadium together as a joint team under the unification flag. And you can see that unification flag here in the bottom left. So this echoed the opening ceremony of the 2000 Sydney Olympics, where the two Koreas marched under one banner for the first time since the Korean War during the Sunshine Policy period. The two Koreas also fielded a joint women's ice hockey team. And the North Korean cheer squad that was at all of the events with North Korean participants made a huge impression in the international coverage of the games. So you can see them pictured here on the left in the middle. On the back of that hasty track two diplomacy conducted behind the scenes at the Winter Olympics, Kim Jong-un and South Korean President Moon Jae-in met for a historic summit at the Joint Security Area in Panmunjom at the DMZ. This was the third inter-Korean summit, which followed on from the 2000 and 2007 summits of the Sunshine Policy Era. So at this summit, the two leaders signed a document called the Panmunjom Declaration. And this declaration included three key points. So one, the two Koreas affirmed their non-aggression pact from the 1992 Agreement on Reconciliation, Non-Aggression and Exchanges and Cooperation. Two, they agreed to a phased disarmament of conventional forces that are mobilized against each other, but excluding nuclear weapons. And three, they also stated a commitment to working towards a permanent peace treaty to end the Korean War. Now, it's important to note that none of these measures were new. They've been a feature of previous inter-Korean summit declarations in 2000 and 2007. But the importance of the Panmunjom Declaration was its intent to begin de-escalation from the 2017 crisis by establishing some preliminary building blocks of confidence building. The two leaders again agreed to an impromptu one-day summit on the 26th of May in 2018, again at Panmunjom in the DMZ. And this was scheduled at only 24 hours notice at the request of Kim Jong-un. So that's an extraordinary quick mobilization and turnaround to get something happening at the leader to leader level. So at this one day meeting, Kim and Moon discussed possibilities for continuing the summit process. And this happened, the, the impetus for this particular summit was because Donald Trump had just canceled his previously announced US North Korea summit that was meant to take place in early June. Kim and Moon also reaffirmed their commitment to implementing the Panmunjom Declaration and to continue high level intergovernmental dialogues. Despite Donald Trump's initial cancellation, June 2018 did eventually see that long delayed US DPRK summit in Singapore. In the joint statement signed by the two leaders at this summit, the two parties committed to cooperation on four different but ambiguous points. 
One, they committed to establishing a new US DPRK relations. So obviously, this was a signal that they'd refrained from the incendiary back and forth of the previous year. But beyond that, it wasn't clear exactly what a new US DPRK relations actually would mean. Two, North Korea re agreed to return the remains of US missing in action soldiers from the Korean War, or MIAs. So there's still a large number of US military personnel that remain unaccounted for from that conflict. Three, the US committed to providing unspecified security guarantees to North Korea. And finally, both parties committed to working towards a lasting and stable peace regime in Korea. Donald Trump had hinted before the summit of the signing of a document to that effect, though this did not ultimately end up happening at the summit. Tellingly, though, there was no mention of complete, verifiable, irreversible denuclearization or CVID. There was no mention of CVID in the statement text. The joint statement instead used North Korea's wording around complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Now, this concession, this was a huge concession by the US negotiating team, and it caused significant consternation within the American foreign policy establishment. And many observers believed that Trump got duped into accepting the North Korean position without really understanding that it effectively called for the United States to fully denuclearize as well. Nonetheless, this summit was unprecedented as the first time that the leaders of the United States and of North Korea had met in person, and that in itself was an important first step in confidence building. In September 2018, South Korean President Moon Jae-in finally accepted Kim Jong-un's previous offer to visit Pyongyang for what was the fifth inter-Korean summit. And this three-day summit produced plenty of symbolism. For example, Moon Jae-in addressed the Arirang Mass Games at Pyongyang's Rungrado May Day Stadium. The two leaders posed for a photo opportunity, which is depicted here, at the crater lake of Pektusan. So that's the mythical birthplace of the Korean nation. So this photo is loaded with nationalist symbolism. And they also promised to increase cultural and sports exchanges between the two Koreas. But more importantly, this summit increased the detail and the scope of confidence building measures that were agreed to in the earlier Panmunjom Declaration. It added detail around the military to military confidence building measures, and there was also more detail fleshed out around economic cooperation, engagement on public health, and environmental capacity building. With the positive momentum of a full year of summit diplomacy, Donald Trump and Kim Jong un met for the much-hyped second US DPRK summit, this time in the Vietnamese, Vietnamese capital city of Hanoi in February 2019. Now, going into the summit, the sticking point was always going to be the nitty-gritty details over the exact interpretation of denuclearization. And this did prove to be the undoing of not just this summit, but the entire summit process. President Trump offered Kim Jong-un a grand bargain of security guarantees and economic aid in exchange for North Korea's full denuclearization. Now, this idea of a grand bargain isn't new. It's been tried before and it's failed every time. And what's more, in swinging for the fences and trying to come away with a comprehensive deal, Trump ended up undoing all of the patient incremental confidence building of the previous year. For its part, North Korea did offer to shut down the Yongbyon nuclear site in exchange for a full removal of economic sanctions. But for the United States, the complete rollback of sanctions was, sanctions was too big of an ask, and Trump abruptly walked away from the summit a day early. Now, this collapse of the Hanoi summit was a huge blow for the engagement process. Some observers observers have argued that North Korea was never serious about a denuclearization deal. Now, from my perspective, I always thought that was pretty obvious to most North Korea watchers going into the summit. Other analysts have said that Trump blew it by going all in with an all or nothing proposal rather than 
offering something with phased incremental steps. Now, North Korea was serious about some things in the negotiations. It was serious about working towards a peace treaty. And that could have been the goal around which common, brown, common ground could have been found. But there was never any common ground around denuclearization. In April 2019, Russian President Vladimir Putin and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un met in Vladivostok. Now, while no agreements were signed at this particular meeting, Kim got another opportunity to boost his legitimacy through the prestige of leader-to-leader -leader diplomacy, while Putin got to explore the possibility of dealing Russia back into North Northeast Asian diplomacy and to network Russia into the East Asian economy more extensively through the Koreas. North Korea's economic modernization drive under Kim Jong-un does have the potential to create extensive opportunities for infrastructure development, and Putin clearly wanted in on those opportunities for Russia. We can also interpret this summit from the perspective of North Korea playing regional states off against each other. So with President Trump and the United States cooling on engagement after the failure at Hanoi, Meeting with Putin created new leverage to try and bring the US back to the table. That leverage appeared to bear some fruit in July 2019 when Trump, Kim and Moon met for a trilateral meeting at the DMZ. This DMZ summit was an attempt to get the summit process back on track after the collapse of the Hanoi summit. And this is not insignificant. This kind of meeting would have been unthinkable only 18 months prior to have the leaders of the US and South Korea and North Korea meeting together, especially at the DMZ, was an unprecedented event. And it also proved to be the first time ever that a sitting American president set foot on North Korean soil, albeit only by a few steps when Kim Jong-un invited Donald Trump to take a short walk across the barrier at the DMZ. The positive spin on this summit was that it aimed to re-establish the patient state-to-state -state relationship building required to help the US and North Korea reach a stage where a more substantive agreement could be discussed. The symbolism was also important in signaling intent to the publics of all three countries and for the US and South Korea in particular Building domestic support for engagement was key to the ultimate ratification of any future agreement. Now, in contrast, the critical interpretation of the summit was that it was a heavily manicured photo op at which nothing substantive was agreed to. And in hindsight, that critical interpretation won the day. The DMZ summit proved to be the final chapter of the 2018-2019 season of summits in Korea. In the background of all this summit activity were a series of five meetings between Kim Jong-un and Chinese President Xi Jinping between February 2018 and June 2019. Now, there was a lot of public pageantry surrounding these five meetings but the details of the substance of the discussions is quite limited due to the greater secrecy surrounding these meetings. However, what details that have emerged suggest that Kim provided briefings to Xi on the possibilities and the progress of the summits with Trump and Moon, and that the two leaders discussed a mutually beneficial position on the Korean Peninsula peace negotiations. So while China was sidelined side from this main game of US, South Korea, North Korea summits, it was still a player in the game, albeit operating from the background. The only real trinket value that Washington has to offer Kim Jong-un is a formal treaty to conclude the Korean War. And this was outgoing South Korean President Moon Jae-in's preferred endgame as well. It is likely that North Korea very much wants to negotiate an agreement with the United States, but it does want to do so under its own terms. It's no big revelation to long-term North Korea watchers that those terms do not include complete, verifiable, irreversible denuclearization. If we are to see a permanent peace settlement in Korea, it will require the United States to abandon CVID as its end game 
and adopt a strategy of managing a nuclear North Korea for regional stability. So that's quite a change in orientation. And to this point, the United States foreign policy establishment hasn't been on board with this. If there was a peace settlement, though, it would open up significant economic opportunities for the region. There's significant infrastructure links to be established. There'd be greater opportunities for foreign direct investment in North Korea. There's environmental and humanitarian engagement to be had. All of these things are currently being held up by the political uncertainty surrounding the nuclear issue and the restrictions imposed by the economic sanctions regime. Yet, Despite all of these potential benefits of a negotiated settlement in Korea, the prospect of a regional agreement are now very low because the six regional parties don't have a full convergence of interests around this issue. The United States under the Joe Biden presidency has relegated North Korea to a secondary concern. And arguably the United States has had other far more pressing foreign policy and domestic concerns over the last few years from the COVID pandemic to the China rivalry, withdrawal from Afghanistan, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, among other things. Even the January 6, 2021 insurrection in Washington, DC uh, and domestic political division. All of these things are outranking North Korea on the contemporary policy agenda. Biden appears to have defaulted, defaulted to the late Obama strategy of benign neglect in relation to North Korea. The momentum for further summits with the North has well and truly evaporated. In 2022, the Biden administration called for further sanctions measures to be imposed on North Korea in response to its flurry of new ballistic missile tests. Where else Washington's North Korea policy might go is also contingent on South Korean President Yoon Suk-yeol. Yoon campaigned in the 2022 presidential election on a foreign policy platform of taking a harder line against North Korea and moving away from the engagement focus of his predecessor Moon Jae-in. And indeed, periods of conservative presidency in South Korea have typically been low points in inter-Korean relations. And we've seen this previously during the administrations of Im Yung Bak and Park Geun Hye. China's approach to Korean Peninsula diplomacy is understandable in relation to its larger geopolitical imperatives. So, Chinese grand strategy is geared towards maintaining control of buffer regions around a Han Chinese heartland and along the borders of the current Chinese state, so both land and maritime borders. And that's not only for self protection from external threats but also with a view to securing its economic base for an export-oriented economy, which in turn has implications for maintaining its internal political stability, and then the eventual goal for regional preeminence. So with this in mind, the government of the Chinese Communist Party have continually supported North Korea as a bulwark against American encroachment along that Sino-DPRK border. As you will remember from our very earliest videos on the history of Korea, the Korean Peninsula has traditionally been a highway for interaction between China and Japan, but more importantly, also the site of Sino-Japanese conflict and an invasion corridor for threats from Japan to that Chinese heartland. Remember that during the Ming and the Qing dynasties, Imperial China maintained Choson Korea as a tribute state that also fulfilled this buffer function against shogunate Japan. The lesson that China's political class of today take from that period of history is that China became vulnerable when its client buffer state in Chosun began to break down, which allowed Japan a foothold on the mainland and, a, and an eventual base to invade China directly. So that historic experience informs today's strategic culture in China which is how they interpret the potential risk of US forces being stationed on the Chinese frontier in a unified Korea. However, North Korea as a buffer zone becomes a strategic liability for China if North Korea is politically unstable, either through the North's collapse or through war. So China has an interest in North Korea's political stability. 
that com and that stability commands the attention of American forces in East Asia that would otherwise be solely concerned with containing China. So a prickly North Korea distracts the Americans. But China also wants a North Korea that's not too aggressive, that's not too prickly. A North Korea that doesn't risk conflict escalation with the US through its nuclear provocations. So this is how we can interpret China's approach to Korean Peninsula nuclear diplomacy. China has been happy to play honest broker between the US and North Korea, as it did when it hosted all five rounds of the six party talks between 2003 and 2009. But it doesn't enforce UN Security Council sanctions against North Korea, and it provides veto protection for the DPRK in the Security Council. However, from time to time, China will briefly enforce sanctions measures if it sees Kim Jong-un overstepping the bounds of what it expects of North Korea as a buffer state. If we consider Japan, Japan's concerns with North Korea are also long-standing. The Japanese supports North Korean denuclearization on the grounds that the DPRK's nuclear and ballistic missile capability poses a direct threat. North Korea's rocket tests often land in the Sea of Japan or fly directly over Japanese territory to land in the Pacific Ocean. So you, you have to take that seriously if you're the Japanese government. And this is also a reminder that North Korea is more than capable of hitting targets anywhere in Japan. If we're thinking strategic culture, as the only country that's been attacked with atomic weapons, many people in Japan are acutely sensitive to North Korea's nuclear threat. And the extensive American military presence in Japan also means that Japanese territory is rich with potential military targets for North Korean attacks in the event of war in Korea. The abduction of Japanese citizens by North Korean agents in the 1970s and 80s is also a festering sore. But this festering sore is also the basis for Japan's engagement with the DPRK. So for Japan to support any denuclearization and or peace agreement in Korea, this has to include resolution of the abduction issue. Also for Japan, North Korea sits within a broader set of concerns about the rise of China, which encompasses a range of issues, including access to resources and open sea lanes, the Senkaku Diaoyu Islands maritime dispute, among other things. So the Korean Peninsula and Korean Peninsula security is always nested within larger geopolitical games. Russia's interests in Korea are more limited and much less extensive than the relationship that the USSR had with North Korea during the Cold War. Russia's primary concern in the Putin era vis-a-vis -vis North Korea is to integrate its isolated Russian Far East into the Asian regional economy, principally by linking Russian oil and gas pipelines and rail networks to South Korea and Japan through North Korea. And much of this activity is centered on the Rasong Special Economic Zone in North Korea. So for this to take off, it needs a stable North Korea and a political settlement in Korea, which would be advantageous to Russia's ambitions for infrastructure development in the DPRK. Like China, Russia doesn't enforce UN sanctions against the DPRK, but this is not as consequential because the economic relationship with North Korea is far more limited. Russia also sees North Korea as a fellow traveler in its balance of power coalition against the United States, along with China. So why are the diverging interests of regional states such an inhibitor of diplomatic negotiations in the Korean context? When states engage in negotiations with each other and they don't trust the countries they're negotiating with, then they often engage in hedging. They have a bet each way and they don't commit fully to any agreed measures because they expect to be burned. And this hedging dynamic is definitely in play in US DPRK relations. It's actually completely rational for both Washington and Pyongyang to hedge, given both of their past disappointments. 
It's also clear that North Korea has milked the US and milked other regional states for aid and concessions, particularly through that six-party talks period, when they didn't have any desire to relinquish nuclear weapons. Without mutual trust, agreements have tended to collapse at the first hurdle. Paper agreements negotiated at summits are not an achievement in and of themselves, but they're usually the beginning point of a longer process to actualize on the ground what's been agreed to in the negotiating process. And this requires clearly articulated confidence building measures and implementation steps. These confidence building measures are important because they gradually increase the depth of interactions between states over time. And that's important, particularly where there's not a traditional basis of mutual trust between the negotiating parties. Confidence building measures create relationships. They can be economic, governmental, institutional, people to people relationships. And these relationships create flows of information and wealth and resources that can over time fundamentally change the dynamics of those interstate relationships. And that's the thing, that level of depth just isn't there in US-North Korea relations. It's more so there in inter-Korean relations, but certainly not with the US and the DPRK. Now here's some of the generalizable lessons I'm taking away from today's material. The testing of weapon systems, and that includes nuclear weapons and ballistic missile systems, this serves several different purposes and communicates different things to different audiences, both external and domestic. The symbolism of diplomatic summits is important, but summits are only the beginning of a longer term trust building and engagement process. Diplomatic negotiations are extremely difficult when negotiating parties don't trust each other and when there's not an agreed upon end goal to work toward. And a final point I'd like to make, and an important caveat to my analysis in this video, is that in order to fully understand the positions of the other regional states on Korean Peninsula nuclear diplomacy, we ultimately need to go through the same deep process of investigating each state as we have this semester in investigating North Korea. With that in mind, what I've attempted to show you in Poll 2 CPA is a method for doing just that, is a framework for cultivating deep understanding of any state, not just North Korea. And this is a method that combines all levels of analysis in international relations. So the global and international system, the state and the individual. So the international system covers the mechanics of global politics, including power relations between states, includes alliances and great power politics, as well as international organizations and an understanding of geopolitics. At the state level, we're looking to examine states in terms of their political system and their decision-making processes, their type of government, as well as how their people, their geography, history and culture all impact on the behavior of their governments in that international system. And from the perspective of the individual level, we're examining individual leaders and the bureaucratic politics in which those individual leaders operate, as well as how political psychology all combine to influence foreign policy. So the best analyses combine all three levels to try and paint a detailed picture. And that's the detailed picture that I've tried to get us to create through our journey in Poll 2 CPA. As you prepare for the assessment related to this topic, these themes might be useful to your research. And by all means, do add any other key themes that stand out for you.